Next up, we have Bill Gross, lifelong entrepreneur, founder of Idealab, and CEO of Heliogen. Bill serves on the boards of directors of numerous companies and is also a member of the Board of Trustees of Caltech and the Art Center College of Design. Bill received his BS in Mechanical Engineering from Caltech. Let's hear from Bill on radical ideas to save the planet. Technological innovation is our best weapon. Hi, I'm Bill Gross. And I'm excited to talk to you about radical ideas to save the planet. I believe that technological innovation is our best weapon. We have a serious problem because the world is on fire. We've all seen this. We are trashing the earth, not just the earth on the ground, but also the earth in the atmosphere. Each of us produces about one pound of trash that we place into landfills every day. So about 7 billion pounds of trash every day. But less well known than that is that we each put about 31 pounds of CO2 trash up into the atmosphere. So we put 31 times as much trash up as we do down. That is a huge amount. Each of us is adding 100,000 cubic meters of CO2 to the sky every single day. This is drawn to scale. That's a person and the volume of CO2 that each person is placing into the atmosphere. If it weren't so invisible, maybe we would have acted sooner. The amount we're placing is so, so large. We're all placing it into that thin sliver of atmosphere. We're treating that atmosphere as our new landfill for CO2. The extra heat that we're adding to the earth because of that CO2 is the equivalent of three Hiroshima bombs going off every single second. It's a staggering amount of thermal energy we are adding to planet Earth. Of course, the effects have been noticed and they've been catastrophic. We have more severe fires, more severe droughts, more severe storms, and much worse to come. Amazingly, the problem is pretty simple in just four words. Those four words though are hard to achieve. Stop burning fossil fuels. If we could stop burning fossil fuels, we could solve this problem completely. But that is very, very hard because we love our lifestyles. Energy accounts for all of our comfort, convenience, productivity, safety, and our dramatic GDP growth. On this graph, you can see the GDP of planet Earth humming along relatively flat till about 1800, 1850, during the Industrial Revolution and beyond, when we discovered we could burn fossil fuels to dramatically improve our lifestyles. And we have not stopped ever since. And energy is the biggest industry on earth. It's 10% of the entire $86 trillion global GDP. So we are spending a lot of money on this. And it's a very, very big business. Price matters a lot because it affects so many things. Every time you reduce the price of energy on a per kilowatt hour basis by about a penny, that leads to a trillion dollar increase in market share. That's how sensitive it is. A penny leads to a trillion dollars of extra market size. And when you increase the price by a penny, people are not willing to pay more. People protest. They go in the streets and protest. These are protests from France, from Iran. People really, really get angry when their price goes up and look at how much the price has gone up recently. So how do we make renewable energy cheaper than fossil fuel? If we could do that, we could solve the problem. That's where I think technological innovation comes in. And I'll tell you my story of how to get there. I will share some of the lessons that I've learned starting more than 150 companies over the last 25 years. My journey led to discovering some of the critical things that I feel we need to do to make this work. 25 years ago, I started Ideal Lab as a technology incubator. It was a business designed to create businesses. We have the shared resources for company creation. I modeled it initially after Edison's labs. Edison basically had a startup studio where he prototyped new ideas, whether it was the phonograph or the light bulb, the movie camera, and spun them out into separate companies when he found ideas that had promise. I wanted to do the same thing at Idea Lab. I started off with these 12 ideas in 1996. And then since then, we've had 5,000 ideas across many industries. We've chosen the best 150 to start companies with, and we've had 50 successful IPOs and, and mergers and acquisitions across all these years. I've learned a lot of painful lessons because we've had a lot of failures too. 60 of these companies that we started did not succeed. And I tried to extract out 
the best lessons learned from across all those companies and how those could apply to the clean technology challenge we have today. My most valuable lessons learned over the last 25 years. Well, this slide shows you the top 25 things that I feel I've learned in the last 25 years. Now, you don't have to worry about reading these on this screen. They're for free, available at the Idea Lab website. So you can take a look at them there. But I've pulled out a few of them and I will show you how they apply, particularly to climate change. The first one is challenge the status quo. At first, when you have an idea that really challenges the status quo, you might be ridiculed or fail for having a great idea ahead of your time. But in fact, ideas at first that are bold and important are often ridiculed. They often move to being violently opposed and then finally accepted as self-evident. Now, when you make an idea pass through all three of those stages, you really have changed the world and made something new come into being that would not have happened otherwise. Well, the clean technology revolution we're doing right now is so important. It was ridiculed at first, maybe a decade ago or two decades ago. It's now violently opposed by some incumbents who have a lot at stake with, with the existing energy products that they make. But I believe we're very close to getting to it being accepted as self-evident. Of course, it's accepted as self-evident by some people and by many of you watching this. What we need to do is get the whole world to realize that, and that will be the real change that we need. Second big lesson, find great timing. I found that timing accounts for success in an idea way more than anything else, uh, way more than I realized too, maybe more than funding, maybe even more than the business model. The world really has to be ready for what you're offering. And with climate change right now, the world is ready. They are embracing solutions. My number 14 lesson learned, very important one here, is use Moore's law. Exponential curves crush linear. Nothing has ever gone down as much in price or as fast as the cost of computing power. So if you can smartly harness that, that can be a secret weapon in the tool against competing with fossil fuels. And I'll show you an example. If you take a look at all commodities over time, whether it's oil, or beef, or coffee, or any commodity, aluminum, doesn't matter, they fluctuate wildly over time. Like right now, right now, steel prices are way up. But the one thing that has gone down consistently is the price of computation, the green curve here, which is just declining fully, consistently, every year, in and out. That means that if we can use more bytes to achieve fewer atoms, then we can be more competitive with fossil fuels. And I'll show you one example of how we've done that. The next lesson I learned was iterate like crazy. You never get it perfect out of the gate. So in any climate tech effort, you really need to continue to improve, refine. Think about what, what the sunlight has done to fossil fuels over the last millions of years. It was a form of iteration, uh, improving and refining them over time. Our ideas need to do the same thing if we wanna compete against that. And my last lesson learned, uh, be persistent. The emotional journey of creating anything great is very challenging. It almost always has a dark swamp of despair somewhere in the middle. It's almost never straight up and to the right. Occasionally that happens, but rarely. And I can say that with the experience of starting 150 companies, most of the time you reach this point in the middle where you really, really feel like you maybe need to give up. And powering through that, innovating through that is what makes the difference. So now, how does that apply to this challenge that the world is facing right now? Well, at Ideal Lab, we look for opportunities that are big and broken and brainstorm technology solutions to fix them. Well, right now I feel humanity's biggest challenge is powering the planet renewably. We need thousands of things to do that. We need thousands of different places to deploy that. I'm gonna talk about just one where I've deployed those particular lessons learned to try and make an active solution. And that is solar energy, to displace fossil fuel, actually displace the burning of fossil fuel. How can we use concentrated sunlight to replace the burning of fossil fuel? Well, right now we burn many different fuels, wood, coal, oil, gas, and they all have a huge amount of emissions of CO2. This is a graph of the amount of emissions per gigajoule of energy from each of those four key things that we burn. Hydrogen, when you burn it, produces zero emissions. Right now, hydrogen comes almost entirely from methane. When you break hydrogen off of methane, CH4, you release CO2. So when you burn hydrogen, it produces zero emissions, but when you make hydrogen, it produces emissions. So how can we make hydrogen without making any emissions? We could then have a transportable and renewable fuel. Well, hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. 
It's 73% of all the atoms in the universe. However, on Earth, almost all of hydrogen is connected to either fossil fuels, hydrocarbons, or biological mass, or to water. So to separate it takes energy. And right now, to separate hydrogen from methane, CH4, is three times cheaper than separating it from water, H2O. But if we can drive down the price of separating hydrogen renewably from water, then we really can have something that can replace fossil fuels. So at one of my companies, Heliogen, we are building what we call a sunlight refinery. It will enable 100% green hydrogen production. It's a concentrated solar field in a modular size that can someday achieve that. The important way to achieve that is to have renewable energy that is available all the time. Right now, one of the main problems with renewable energy is it's intermittent. Solar panels have a, what's called a capacity factor of 21%. They're very inexpensive electricity they produce, but they only produce them about 21% of the time, basically when the sun is shining around noon. Wind farms are a little bit more expensive, three to four cents per kilowatt hour, but they have about a 33% capacity factor. What Heliogen is striving to do is what we call anytime energy production, almost 24 seven with higher than 85% capacity factor. The way we do that is by storing thermal energy and then converting that to the electricity we need to make hydrogen around the clock. We took a look at former concentrated solar that looks like this, but whose maximum temperature is 575 degrees C. And we said, how can we apply Moore's law to this technology? How can we iterate and apply Moore's law to this to try and both get the cost, the temperature higher, the cost of storage lower, and thus be able to make energy around the clock? We built a modular system that looks like this. This is actually in the desert in Lancaster, California. It's 400 computer controlled mirrors, but the novel computer control is that on the tower up on the right are cameras. Those cameras look out at the field and use computer vision, again, lots of computation, which is now cheap, to make those mirrors point more precisely, allowing us to achieve higher temperatures. We went through many, many iterations of our mirror design to make that work. In fact, here's the first 12 of them, but here's 500 of them that we did over many, many years. We started this company in 2013 and went through hundreds of iterations before we came up with a design that combined with Moore's law would allow us to drive down the price. Here I am standing in a field of those mirrors. You can see the mirrors are relatively small, importantly small so we can make them in a factory. And here's what the cameras see. The computer vision system sees all these mirrors and is making minute micro adjustments to get all of them to point perfectly right up at that target, which you can see on the right here, pointing the light into an image the size of a basketball hoop, achieving these very high temperatures. And then we take the high temperatures and we store that in a tank, which is either rocks or ceramic or sand, which we can insulate to hold on to energy for when after the sun goes down. And holding that energy in rocks or sand or ceramic is almost two orders of magnitude cheaper than batteries. It's way, way cheaper because you're just storing the thermal energy, not having to store it chemically. That will someday hopefully lead us to make green hydrogen for less than the price of dirty hydrogen. When we can achieve that, that will really allow us to have the combination of low price always on energy and transportable renewable energy. Because once you have an energy molecule, you can move it from point A to point B. You can move it from where you make it to where you need it. Uh, and that really will allow us to replace the burning of fossil fuels. So that's what we're working on at Heliogen. Here's how Moore's law made a big difference. We need to use fewer atoms. We need to use less materials. We're using software instead of steel to achieve our accuracy. We're using less labor because we can make it in a factory instead of a field. We can use robotics. We're using less calibration because our closed loop control means there's no pre-calibration. The units are always calibrated. This is just one example of using Moore's law, but I feel this can be used in many of those thousands of applications that I told you we need to really make an impact in this green revolution. When you convert sunlight to fuel, anyone with sunlight can be a solar energy exporter, not just Saudi Arabia. Now, of course, you can go in Saudi Arabia, take a small portion of it in the desert, and also make the equivalent amount of energy exported as you do from all the oil fields in only 4% of the land. But you don't have to do it just in Saudi Arabia. You can do it all over the earth. 
You can see here in the entire Southwest United States, all of Western South America, North Africa, South Africa, all of Australia, there's incredible sunshine. You can make green hydrogen in those locations and move it to where the sunshine isn't as great and still have green energy everywhere. To summarize very quickly, I would say, we started out in humanity living in the biology era. We got all our energy from our, from our muscles and from plants. We then moved on to the chemistry era. The chemistry era was when we got all of our energy from burning things. We're still in that era, but that era is causing all the CO2 emissions that's going up into our atmosphere. We need to move into the physics era where we get all our energy from the sun, the wind and from nuclear, where we're using physics, not chemistry, not burning things to power our civilization. That will really be the final era and the, and the huge opportunity for humanity. I feel this is the best time in history for climate change and energy change, energy transition entrepreneurship. Why? There's more money available. The demand is off the charts. The whole world is reachable. Every single part of the energy business can be disrupted with new technology and the world finally cares. So the timing is right. I showed you just one example with this company Heliogen, but like I said, we need thousands of efforts like this. I would love to find ways to work to, together to bring this and many other ideas to the world. I hope I've given you some ideas and I'd be thrilled if this inspires something beneficial. Feel free to reach out to me on bill at heliogen.com or bill at idealab.com. I would love to see if we can inspire more ways to work together to make this be self-evident, that third stage of truth that I talked about earlier. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience.